Good morning, afternoon, or evening to this distributed audience. I'm glad to have the chance to talk to you about the Human Connectome Project. Let me start with some numbers. I love numbers about the brain. Each of you tuned into this has a brain with about 86 billion neurons in the several pounds of squishy tissue fitting inside your skull. The dominant structure that you see on the left is the cerebral cortex. It contains about 80% uh, of the brain mass, but it's really only 20% of the total neuronal count. That's because it's dominated by the 150 trillion or so synapses that communicate information from one neuron to another. And it also involves about 100,000 miles worth of white matter axons conveying information over long distances. The cerebellum is a tiny structure on the lower left that's about 10% of the brain mass. It actually contains the great majority of all your neurons. And then there's another collection of structures uh, the rest of the brain that are basically subcortical nuclei that are critically important for keeping us alive and well, even though there are very few in number, fewer than 1% of your total neuronal count. So our challenge for today and for the rest of the century, if not the millennium, is to do our best to untangle this extremely complicated uh, network of connections that makes us uh, alive well and incredibly uh, able to do complex intellectual things such as generate and just listen to uh, this presentation. Analogies are often made between brains and computers, uh, even though physically they're very different. Um, the uh, computer power has continued to escalate. Uh, it was 15 years ago or so uh, that the world championship in chess was handed over to a computer. Uh, computers do their business by processing elements, hardware that can literally do gigaflops worth of computations, uh, yet uh, our brains do amazingly well with uh, neurons and synapses that operate at a much slower speed, uh, impulses on the order of one to 100 spikes per second. So the challenge for computers is to understand the operation of the system at the level of the hardware, the operating systems, and the many applications that um, make our computers useful. For the brains uh, that we're dealing with today, we want to understand the wiring, uh, the signals that you know, physiologically carry information from one place to another. We want to use it to understand our own behaviors as well as that of animal models. Over the past decade, there's been much excitement about the general uh, domain of connectomics. A connectome is, in quotes, a comprehensive map of neuronal connections. But we put it in quotes because it's comprehensive only to a, a particular scale. So I'll be talking today about the macroscopic scale, what we call the macroconnectome exploration of long distance connections from one patch of gray matter to another through the underlying white matter, but down to the resolution of the imaging elements, the voxels that are on the order of one to two millimeters on a side. There's another world of the microconnectome that uh, aims to reconstruct in exquisite detail every neuron, glial cell, axon, dendrite, and synapse but currently that's achievable, attainable only to the level of a fraction of a cubic millimeter. That is less than one of the voxels that we image the human brain with. Intermediate in this realm is the world of the mesoconnectome, which uses anat anatomical tracers in animal models to explore local and long distance uh, connections with intermediate spatial resolution. So as I said earlier, we're going to focus on the macroconnectome and the human brain. Before we get to the Human Connectome Project proper, I want to give some important introductory overview remarks about cerebral cortex in general in, in mammals, about cartography, connectivity, and individual variability, because they're really critical to understanding the scope of the problem and the ways in which we can attack it. So brains come in many sizes. Uh, our brain is about a thousandfold larger than the mouse brain and has uh, more than a thousand times as many neurons. The macaque mon monkey, which is the most intensively studied animal model, is 10 times uh, smaller than our brains. And our brains are three times larger than that of a chimpanzee shown on the left. That's our closest living uh, great ape uh, relative. 
You can see at a glance that the cortical convolutions vary enormously from the smooth brain lissencephalic mouse to our highly convoluted cortex. And that brings us to the realm of cortical conic cartography. I am a, a, a card-carrying cartographer of the brain. I've uh, been doing it for several decades. I started uh, several, back in the 1970s literally using pencil and tracing paper to make uh, flat maps, as you can see on the lower left of this panel, of the macaque monkey's cerebral cortex, the portions involved in vision. A decade or so later, um, my colleague Dan Fallman and I were able to make a manually uh, pencil and tracer uh, map of the entire macaque's cerebral cortex and to use information from the literature to parcelate the cortex into dozens of distinct cortical areas. So the colored ones are visual areas in the macaque monkey identified on the basis of differences or distinctiveness in their function, their architecture, their connectivity, and or their topography, that is the representations of the visual world mapped onto the cortical sheet. And a couple of those areas, the primary visual area V1, as well as the uh, little tiny area MT, are poster children in the sense that they were identifiable by all of these methods and were consistently and, and reliably studied. Most other cortical areas at that time and even to this day have fuzzy boundaries and it's still contentious as to exactly where the boundaries are for many of these. It's just hard to make accurate maps of animal models and even harder when we get to the human cerebral cortex as you'll see, but we are making headway. Part of the challenge in dealing with the human cortex is the vastly greater complexity of the convolutions. Uh, on the left you see a structural magnetic resonance imaging or MRI slice and um, that is the, the um, uh, one slice uh, cut about midway through the brain. Cerebral cortex is on the top, the cerebellum is on the bottom, and the cerebral cortex is, cortex is outlined by little gray, you know, green and blue contours that capture the shape of the cortical convolutions in every single slice. We can use that information to uh, generate three-dimensional models such as the type you see on the right or the three-dimensionality captures all of the intricacies of the cortical folds. We can use that to map information. We can also inflate and uh, visualize inside the folds as you'll see in, in later slides. I mentioned the challenges of, of parcellation. Now let's have an update of where we are uh, in this decade. Uh, the mouse, as I said, is a much simpler model and it's also been mapped more accurately. Um, um, the, uh, there are about 40 different cortical areas that Andreas Burkhalter's lab has charted, some large, some small, but they're tiding the entire surface and they've been mapped with uh, considerable fidelity. The macaque monkey, which we look at next, here is an inflated version of the macaque map and, in, and an updated parcellation scheme, which shows about a 130 cortical areas. So it's more extensive than the previous map, uh, but it's not ground truth. There, as I said before, are still debates about many of these boundaries. For the human cortex shown on the right, we have accurate maps to currently of about 50 different areas shown in colors on the, on the surface model that's been inflated. And um, those are accurately mapped using anatomical as well as functional MRI methods, but there are large gaps in between where we know a lot, but we don't have accurate uh, cartographic maps. We estimate that when, by the time uh, these gaps are filled in in the next year or so using data from the Human Connectome Project, there may be 150 to 200 areas, uh, but uh, doing an accurate mapping of that is a major challenge. One way we can get a handle on this is to uh, compare across species. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the macaque is one-tenth the size of our brain, but the differences are, that have occurred during recent human evolution are dramatic in terms of their regional specificity. So these figures show the degree of expansion during the, the recent human evolution and the red hotspots uh, that uh, you can see in the middle panel 
show uh, regions of 20 to 30 fold expansion in human cortex relative to the macaque. And these regions uh, turn out to be uh, domains that are implicated in higher cognitive functions in humans. We can also compare across species using maps of myelin content. So in this lower panel, the red and yellow regions are regions that are heavy in myelin content. They communicate information faster. Um, uh, and in the human cortex, what you can see is that in the blue regions here, they are more lightly myelinated and that is restricted to the domains that have expanded most recently and are involved in higher cognitive function. So this basic anatomical feature of myelin content is a signature of functional organization. Uh, and we can also compare the myelin maps across species in chimpanzees. It's hard to get a lot of data from chimpanzees, but one that is feasible is to get these myelin maps that you can see here. And you can see uh, as the arrows show that the regions of chimpanzee cortex that are blue and presumably implicated in higher cognitive function are much smaller than in the human. So the, the explosion of human cortical uh, tissue is devoted primarily to the things that make us smarter. It, may, it makes sense, but it's nice to have anatomical evidence uh, for this. So a few basics about connectivity. Again, giving you a quick historical perspective. Uh, decades ago, we thought uh, the connections between the brain in the, in the monkey, the different visual areas, we had only a handful that could be identified. Uh, uh, 15 years later, my graduate student, John Mansell, identified more pathways, but also showed that the different cortical areas could be arranged in a hierarchy from lower visual processing in V1 and V2 up to many higher stages. And Dan Fellman and I, and I carried this uh, even farther with this subway chart kind of visualization uh, domain that you see in the lower left that contains dozens of visual areas and several hundred connections. Uh, and we could also display the same information as a uh, connectivity matrix, a 32 by 32 array showing the presence or absence of connections between different visual areas. It was frustrating at the time that there was very little quantitative data available, uh, even though we knew that there was a wide range of connection strengths. A decade later, my graduate student, uh, Jim Lewis, made maps of cortical connectivity for selected uh, uh, tracer injections into different visual areas, showing that it was possible to quantify this, but it was extremely hard work and we only had a handful of uh, such charts uh, at that time. A decade later, in the past several years, Henry Kennedy's lab uh, have uh, carried this uh, uh, a major ways forward in a way that gives us a quantitative map of connection strengths for dozens of cortical areas, such as the arrow pointing to an injection in the lower left here of visual area V2, and the connectivity that you can see in the panel in the upper right shows a handful of connections that are very strong, powerful, and many that are intermediate in the middle range and many that are very weak. And this is a logarithmic plot. So the range of connection strengths uh, revealed by this are literally five orders of magnitude. And when this is done on 29 different uh, injected areas, one gets a map shown on the right here of over 1,600 pathways identified to date, and extrapolation would suggest there are 5,000 or more pathways in the macaque monkey, and presumably the same in the human. So we should appreciate that when we want to explore the human connectome, we should expect to find an extraordinarily complex uh, set of connectivity patterns. So adding to the challenge is not only the uh, degree of complexity of human cortical convolutions, but also their variability from one individual to the next. So each of you has a unique uh, pattern of cortical folding. Uh, the four examples shown here, uh, if you look closely, you can see they, there are some similarities, but a lot of differences. And uh, that's true even though these uh, four individuals were chosen from a set of identical twins. So two of these are identical twins. And it would be very hard for you to look at this and identify based on the folding characteristics, who are the twins. So I'll just show you the answer. 
The upper pair are identical twins, and yet look at the arrows. The folding patterns are strikingly different in many regions, despite their genetic uh, uh, identity. Same for the lower ones. And so what this shows us uh, when it's looked at quantitatively and carefully is that there is some heritability to cortical folding patterns, but it's much less than you might have guessed. Uh, and uh, that brings me to an important um, sidebar comment about the nature of cortical folding and why does the cortex actually fold. And I'll give you my perspective on this, uh, which was a light bulb moment that came on about 17 years ago. It started with the realization that cortical folding uh, occurs in humans in late uh, gestation, the third trimester of gestation, and it occurs right around the time that long distance pathways are being established within the underlying white matter. I wondered whether that was a co coincidence or whether there was a cause and effect relationship. And I was aware of experimental studies that axons, at least in a tissue culture dish, actually generate a little bit of mechanical tension. And so that led to the idea schematized in the right-hand panel here that uh, long distance connections through the for, uh, newly established white matter could lead to cortical folding if all of the axons between one cortical area and another gently pulled together, uh, bringing uh, the tissue closer and forming a gyrus in between. Uh, and that would explain the consistency of folding in some regions such as the central sulcus and the calcarine sulcus uh, and the variability in regions that are a balkanized set of competing uh, areas that may differ in size and connectivity patterns. So this is an attractive hypothesis. It helps us think rationally about the nature of cortical folding, but I have to be honest and say this is an, an unproven hypothesis. It's, it's difficult to get uh, compelling evidence, but I think it a, a, remains highly plausible and attractive. Whatever the mechanism, the practical reality for those of us interested in, in exploring uh, the human uh, brain and the, and the cerebral cortex, we have to uh, bring data together into a common spatial framework, what we call a brain atlas, if we want to carefully and quantitatively uh, compare across subjects. In the past, uh, this has traditionally been done as shown on the left-hand panels uh, by aligning the structural MRI volumes from many individuals onto a target a population average atlas. That works especially well for the subcortical structures, the basal ganglia, the thalamus, and the like, because of the, their relative consistency, but it doesn't work terribly well for the cerebral cortex because of the, the complexity and variability of the convolutions that we've already discussed. So instead, uh, the field is advanced by uh, converting to surface-based registration to align across individual cerebral hemispheres. And the example shown here is one that we published a decade ago which uses a, a selected set of consistently localized landmarks to register individuals to an atlas. But that's now a historical relic because we and many others have reverted or converted to an improved intersubject registration approach uh, developed by Bruce Fischel and, and used with the FreeSurfer software, which does a better job of aligning based on shape characteristics uh, across individuals. And you can see a population average uh, cortical uh, sheet uh, on the, the right there. Um, and it's better than its predecessors, but it's not perfect. Uh, and the way to uh, justify that assertion is to note that some cortical areas, such as the little red patch of architectonically defined area V1, is in fact accurately and consistently registered across many individuals. Um, Whereas uh, on the lower right there, uh, a nearby visual area, the so-called MT plus uh, complex, uh, is not accurately aligned using folding characteristics alone. And that's because the variability of the folds and the variability in the location of identified areas in relation to these folds uh, prevents the folding-based alignment from doing a great job on its own. And I'll return to that because I'll show you uh, a little bit later examples of how we can actually improve the alignment across subjects in ways that are critical for getting a better handle on human cortical organization. So that brings me at long last to the Human Connectome Project, 
I'll give you a quick overview and then take you through uh, illustrations of where we are in acquiring and analyzing uh, different uh, mo modalities of information uh, that inform the Connectome project. First, I should uh, applaud the contributions of over 100 investigators and staff members who've been working for the past four years to get this project underway. And, and it's centered at Washington University and University of Minnesota with the, my co-PI, Camille Uberville at, at Minnesota, but it involves 10 different institutions uh, around the world. So our objectives in the Human Connectome Project are to study 1,200 healthy adults, not drawn randomly from the streets of St. Louis, but rather selected from a population of twins and their non-twin siblings. So we're targeting 150 identical twins, 150 uh, fraternal or dizygotic twins, and we're more than halfway through uh, that acquisition effort, as I'll come to in a moment. Uh, but we spent the first two years of the project improving both the hardware and the data acquisition and analysis methods. The scanner we are using is a customized uh, Siemens Skyra, a three, three Tesla uh, scanner uh, that has a stronger gradient insert, 100 millitesla per meter, that lets us get better diffusion imaging data. We're also just about to start scanning up at Minnesota 200 of these 1,200 subjects uh, using a seven Tesla scanner that will improve the in data quality for several of the modalities. A major advance involved the utilization of advanced pulse sequences, in particular what's called multiband parallel imaging that I'll illustrate in a moment that gives us much better uh, data quality. And we're applying that to get uh, diffusion imaging that informs our analysis of long distance pathways through tractography and also resting state functional connectivity and task uh, fMRI, as I'll illustrate in a few moments. We are currently acquiring information from a different modality as well, magnetoencephalography, acquired at uh, our partner institution, St. Louis University, and we're targeting 100 uh, subjects uh, over the coming year. For each of our participants, we get several hours worth of behavioral data that allows us, uh, as we move forward in the analysis, to compare connectivity and brain function with specific behavioral phenotypes uh, drawn from the information in this behavioral rep repertoire. We are acquiring uh, blood samples as well, uh, and uh, we'll be genotyping next year to uh, provide information along that other uh, dimension. We're already making these data freely available and uh, not in a, just a core dump uh, uh, reposit warehouse, but rather a user-friendly informatics platform that I'll touch upon later. So we want this to be a resource for discovery science and a baseline for future studies of brain diseases and disorders. As I mentioned, we spent uh, a, a major amount of time, actually two years uh, at the start of the project for the refinement and optimization effort, not only the improved pulse sequences that I've mentioned already, but also better analysis methods and improved visualization uh, and informatics platforms. And if you're interested in the details on any of these fronts, there are eight papers that came out last year in a special issue on the Connectome in uh, the journal NeuroImage. Now we're in the uh, middle of phase two. Uh, we have a year and a half left to acquire uh, the 1,200 subjects and we're on pace to do that. Uh, last fall, we released data, uh, extensive uh, uh, data sets from over 200 subjects. And later this spring, we're going to release uh, uh, the data for 500 subjects. There was also a recent release of the initial acquisition of MEG data uh, and we're continuing to improve our data mining capabilities. Uh, let me just touch briefly on MEG. Uh, uh, I won't have time to say too much about it, but the attractiveness of it is that it's the one modality that gives us high spatial resolution. Uh, as you can see uh, here, it has a smaller number of sensors, uh, um, 248 for the device that we're using. It gives millisecond time resolution, uh, but much coarser spatial resolution than the, uh, than the functional MRI, but the two together on the same subjects are going to uh, add to the overall capabilities for in, in deep level analysis. And just to illustrate that the, this can work using other data sets, our colleagues in Chieti and Washington University have shown that MEG is able to identify 
resting state networks uh, shown in the different colors there uh, that uh, are closely matched to the functional MRI-based resting state networks that have been identified in other studies. And so we're acquiring resting state MEG as well as task MEG and we'll be uh, uh, continuing to release uh, uh, these data sets as they're acquired. The main modalities relate to MRI, as I've uh, indicated before, and the multiband imaging acquisition is schematized uh, on the, the right there. Normal fMRI has traditionally acquired data one slice at a time from the bottom of the top or top to the bottom of the brain. Multiband imaging allows us to acquire, excite up to eight uh, slices at a time as shown in this uh, illustration and even more is, is possible in, in some full sequences. Uh, and then the, the image data are acquired using a multi-channel head coil that is sensitive in a spatially distributed way and uh, 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 intensive reconstruction um, uh, sophisticated algorithms can be used to un unalias the data and uh, extract the uh, spatial uh, localization very accurately. So already more than 100 sites around the world are using this multiband approach to get better temporal resolution as well as spatial resolution. I'll illustrate this in the context of diffusion imaging first. Um, the white matter is known from classical blunt dissection methods to involve cables running over long distances and these spaghetti-like configurations here uh, illustrate that there is a lot of coherence uh, or co-axial uh, alignment of uh, white matter axons, even though each little uh, bundle, uh, each uh, square millimeter of cross-sectional area has literally hundreds of, of thousands of axonal uh, fibers, mostly myelinated, running through it. It's also known from the um, classical literature that there's a lot of tangling and a lot of crossing fibers uh, that are needed to carry information in the many different directions. And if you'll recall what I took pains to uh, point out about macaque cortical connectivity, if there are literally uh, many, many thousands of long distance connections, then the wiring that uh, mediates them must surely be very complex. Diffusion imaging is an attractive method for uh, deciphering many aspects of long distance connectivity. It relies on the fact that uh, diffusion of water along axons goes faster than it does uh, when water tries to diffuse across uh, axonal membranes and myelinated uh, wrappings around these axons. And uh, the pulse sequences th that we use involve high angular resolution, hundreds of different um, orientations are probed uh, for each voxel in throughout the brain. And then the data can be analyzed in order to estimate not only the dominant fiber bundle orientation, but up to two or three um, alternative or crossing fiber orientations in each voxel. And so the, this has been around for many years now. The, the advantages provided by the Connectome project are that we're using a scanner with stronger gradient strength. We're using multiband, in this case, a multiband factor of three. That allows us to get diffusion imaging voxel sizes of a millimeter and a quarter, which is notably good uh, relative to uh, what's common in the field up to now. We also have improved algorithms for better orientation estimation in each voxel and improvements uh, generated by the Oxford Diffusion Imaging Group to uh, use probabilistic tractography to estimate the likelihood of long distance connections inferred from uh, the diffusion imaging data. A proof of uh, this is shown in the slide you see now. On the left is the, the results of probabilistic tractography from a seed location placed in the the primary motor cortex uh, and using conventional two millimeter uh, diffusion imaging acquisition. On the far right is the same seed location, but now applied to a subject uh, scanned in our connectome scanner with a higher resolution and better data quality. And what you can see in this axial slice is on the connectome project data, we can accurately identify uh, four different long distance tracks uh, from motor cortex to various subcortical uh, targets. 
whereas the data is coarser and has many more false positives uh, using uh, conventional diffusion imaging data. Uh, we can uh, if I can get the oh I now remember that I need to go to the next set of slides so hang on for a second. Uh, now we can uh, uh, look not just one slice at a time, but reconstruct and estimate long distance connections. So we can take for this individual subject uh, and take a seed location at the blue spot in the uh, inferior frontal gyrus and um, take a coronal slice uh, through th that uh, part of the brain and then zoom it up uh, so we can look more closely at it. This next slide shows you the estimate of fiber orientation in all voxels in this slice. Then uh, the probabilistic tractography approach takes a seed location at the tip of the inferior frontal gyrus where the little arrow says seed and shows the probabilistic estimate of long distance connections going through that particular slice. But of course the actual connections go uh, through a complex three dimensional trajectory and our Connectome Workbench visualization platform allows one to see uh, not only selected brain slices, but the 3D trajectory uh, shown in uh, different colors to indicate the dominant uh, direction in which the fiber bundles are passing through each uh, location. This is a 3D image and uh, the, we, I, I'm not able to show you a movie here but the workbench platform allows you to animate this so you can see the three dimensionality uh, uh, to whatever degree you, you like. We can visualize and analyze not only the connections within the white matter, but uh, we can assess their terminations uh, from one gray matter region to another. And uh, we can map the estimated connection density as shown in these lower panels by uh, the uh, seed location, again, uh, in the frontal cortex, this is in the, the uh, uh, approximately the middle frontal sulcus, uh, and, and the red region show local uh, strong connectivity in this subject, as well as long distance connection to the parietal and temporal cortex. And that can be uh, also seen on the lower right on an inflated surface where this, the analysis has been carried out and averaged across nine uh, of our connectome subjects. So it's encouraging that we can see uh, these long distance connections. There are also some important technical challenges and limitations. If you look closely, many of the moderate uh, connection strengths on the lower left panel there seem to run along gyral ridges. And that is in fact consistently the case. And uh, we, it's a problem to deal with that we at least understand the nature of the problem, even as we're working to find better ways to, to uh, cope with it. So uh, if you look at the uh, schematizations and brain slices shown here, we can take in panel B uh, an exemplar uh, gyral ridge, a, a, a gyral crown and the white matter blade that runs under, inside that gyral uh, ridge. And schematically, we would hope that the axons feeding into this part of cortex are running coherently and peeling off in an orderly way to uh, carry information to and from uh, the sulcal banks as well as the gyral crown at the top. But diffusion imaging, because of its coarser spatial resolution, is dominated by the, the signals of the fiber orientations going up to the crown of the ridge. And as a consequence, it, it's empirically the case that uh, as shown on the panels on the right for the human cortex and the monkey cortex, that the density of tractography streamlines is much greater on gyral crowns than it is on sulcal banks or the depths of sulci. That's what the tractography suggests, uh, but it's not anatomical reality. And I hearken back to the slide uh, of the type I showed you previously from retrograde tracers in macaque monkeys that give us a closer estimate of anatomical ground truth um, the red dots show that uh, an injection site uh, in temporal cortex uh, gives strong labeling uh, in gyral uh, um, sulcal banks and sulcal fundi as well as in gyral crowns. And so it's unlikely that the bias suggested by 
diffusion imaging reflects anatomical reality, it's more a, a methodological limitation. So we can hope in the future that it'll be possible to get better data that reduce that bias. It may be possible to use anatomical priors to more accurately model uh, the actual distribution of, of connections. But uh, I would uh, stress that in uh, reading and working with diffusion imaging data, it's very important not to overinterpret the data and, and to be aware of the technical confounds. So that's a quick glimpse of diffusion imaging. Let me move on to, to functional MRI and give you an exemplar of, of what we can learn from task fMRI. So in the Connectome project, we have seven different tasks, uh, three of which I'll illustrate briefly. One of them is a language task. Each participant listens to stories in the scanner and then alternates that with doing arithmetic problems. Uh, there's another task that involves social cognition. Uh, these are uh, in the scanner, they're animations in the social paradigm, the, the triangles are kissing and hugging one and dancing with one another. In the random movement, they're just randomly uh, uh, drifting around. The working memory task uh, 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 challenges each participant to remember whether the current image on the screen matches one, two previously. And if we look at the uh, the kinds of results we can get from this kind of task. Uh, this uh, next slide shows you the anatomical substrate that Connectome Workbench offers for visualization of all parts of interest in the cortical gray matter. So we see the anatomical inflated surface of the left and right cerebral uh, hemispheres from lateral and medial views. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the slices on the upper right show the subcortical gray matter, and we can also visualize the data on the uh, flat map of the cerebellar cortex. So if we uh, show uh, the group average results for the uh, connectome task fMRI, uh, uh, task involving listening to stories versus uh, hearing math arithmetic problems, you can see there's a very complex pattern of activation in yellow and red and deactivation uh, in blue and green that involves many different uh, locations in particularly in the temporal lobe uh, and also in the cerebellum. Uh, in the, the same set of uh, participants, if we look at the social interactions task, we see a, uh, another complex pattern that shows some overlap but many distinctive regions uh, compared to the previous one. And if we look at the working memory, we see a very different uh, but still distributed pattern of spatial activations. So to cut to the chase, uh, what we're learning from this is that each task engages a complex network of brain regions uh, that are partially overlapping with those involved in other tasks. To further decipher this, we're using the method of resting state functional connectivity that has received a lot of attention in recent uh, years. Uh, the advantages we have for the Connectome project are the higher quality, the better spatial resolution, the better temporal resolution, each brain volume, uh, so-called TR, is acquired in seven-tenths of a second instead of multiple seconds. And the patterns we see at one instance are in this schematization or this illustration on the left. If we had a dynamic movie that I uh, could show you, you'd see the fluctuations of high and low blood, uh, bold uh, fMRI signal uh, show a complex, uh, exquisite orchestration of fluctuations that are show many correlations. So if we take the time course uh, for two different regions, we may see that they're strongly correlated or that they're anti-correlated or uncorrelated. And if we do that for all possible combinations of gray matter locations, surface vertices and subcortical voxels of gray matter, we end up with a 90,000 by 90,000 connectivity matrix, what we call a functional dense connectome uh, that's about 30 gigabytes of data for each subject. And we can interrogate that at the level of individual subjects or of group averages and uh, uh, use this to examine functional connectivity maps. For example, location one is a seed uh, location in the uh, parietal cortex of the right hemisphere. And it shows strong functional connectivity both locally and at a long distance in the opposite hemisphere and up in the frontal lobes. A different seed location such as that in somatosensory cortex shows a totally different pattern of functional connectivity. 
And we can probe this in great detail, uh, but when we want to compare across individuals, we have to revisit this issue of the complexity of cortical folding and how it varies across subjects. And I want to illustrate the importance of this and how we're making headway in getting better intersubject alignment using the multimodal surface matching method developed by our colleagues Emma Robinson and Mark Jenkins in at Oxford University. To remind you of the, the, the problem that we face, this is a, uh, an, an expanded view of what I showed you earlier, uh, standard folding-based registration on the cortical surface aligns some regions like V1 very well, but does poorly at other regions like the MT complex. The multimodal surface matching method is a sophisticated um, uh, project process. I won't try to explain the details. I'll just show you uh, a demonstration of how it can in fact work, uh, starting with uh, an, an example from uh, individual subjects and group averages using uh, our older uh, method. So on the upper left, you see the cortical folding pattern from one individual subject. The second panel shows the uh, individual subjects myelin map with the somatomotor strip, the red strip in the middle, and various other hotspots, including those shown by the, the green and blue arrows. If we probe that individual subject's functional connectivity by putting a seed at the location of the green arrow in parietal cortex, we see hotspots of con functional connectivity, such as the frontal eye field shown in the third panel on, the, uh, on this top row. And that uh, corresponds to a gap in the task activation of the mass versus story contrast. If we do the same thing on another subject, we have a different folding pattern, a different individual subject's myelin map, uh, where we can see similar patterns, but they're not precisely localized. And that's true for the functional connectivity and the task activation. So when we use conventional uh, group averaging and alignment, we get in the lower uh, row, the middle, the second panel shows you uh, the, uh, there's uh, reasonably good but still somewhat fuzzy alignment of the myelin maps. The hot spots in uh, the green and blue arrows are a bit fuzzy, and so is the functional connectivity and the task activation. Whereas if we do the same analysis but now using the, the functional connectivity and the myelin maps to improve the registration, it, it's dramatically better in, particularly in the regions shown in the lower panel. So now the group average myelin uh, is much sharper, as is the group average functional connectivity uh, and the task activation. If I go back to the previous panel, it's fuzzy. If I go back to the, uh, the MSM-based uh, uh, um, multimodal uh, registration, it's sharper in the group average and that's because the spatial patterns shown in the upper panels have gotten uh, uh, aligned using uh, the functional and myelin map data. Uh, so that's the proof of concept that has us excited about uh, the way we can advance the analysis of cortical organization and function. Now I want to give you, in the last few minutes, a, a few illustrations of how we can use this kind of data to explore interesting aspects of brain function and its relationship to behavior. So one approach pioneered by Steve Smith at Oxford and his colleagues uh, uses independent components analysis or ICA decomposition to identify spatially localized regions uh, based on the commonality of their functional MRI time series data. So here are exemplar uh, ICA nodes uh, showing in the upper panel uh, the, uh, a node involved in the somatosensory and motor face representation region. Uh, the second panel shows you uh, a, a node that's related to the hand representation just in the left hemisphere. The lower two panels show you two different nodes relating to central vision and peripheral vision concentrated in the calcarine sulcus area V1. One can do that for, the, in this example, uh, uh, 98 different ICA components, and in the upper left uh, uh, quadrant is the functional correlation uh, matrix, connectivity matrix, using uh, the full correlation, that is the, the time series data after uh, cleaning up with uh, denoising techniques. And you can see a, a rich comp and complex pattern of connectivity that can be sorted according to major brain networks 
that are shown on the upper right. So these uh, 10 different uh, brain networks uh, are identified uh, based on the commonality of their uh, uh, functional MRI data. It's similar to what's been published in other studies by Randy Buckner's lab and C. Peterson's lab, but here we're getting a finer spatial granularity thanks to the higher quality of the data. We can also uh, regress out the common features and generate a partial correlation network such as that shown in the lower uh, right below the diagonal. And that gives us what may be a better estimate of the selective uh, connectivity between each of these ICA uh, nodes or parcels. So this can be done not only in the group average as shown here, but in individual subjects. So we can take the group average uh, uh, partial correlation matrix uh, that's now reoriented and, and occupies the upper right hand, and we can do, use the dual regression approach uh, developed by Steve Smith and colleagues to identify the partial correlation matrix for each individual subject, and we can reorganize uh, this uh, data set into essentially a, a long uh, 4,700 uh, uh, values for each uh, uh, pair of uh, network edges. And we can do that for all 131 subjects for this analysis. And the streakiness indicates the commonalities of functional connectivity patterns across individuals. Uh, and now we can take this rich uh, uh, data collection and correlate it with behavioral measures in the same population of subjects, as well as to analyze heritability. And just to give you teasers to uh, uh, illustrate the proof of concept, if we use the observed uh, um, intelligence uh, value by the measure of behavioral intelligence, the fluid intelligence that we have, uh, we can compare that to the predicted uh, intelligence um, measure using the functional connectivity data. And they are in fact correlated and we can use that to identify which pairs of uh, connect connections or which edges in the connectivity matrix are most informative. And the most informative particular one is a connection between the frontal lobe and the uh, medial uh, hippocampal region as shown here. Uh, another one uh, that is uh, of interest is a, a, a connection between the cerebellum and the parietal and temporal uh, independent components nodes. So this is just a, a, a teaser. Uh, one other example uh, shown in the next slide if we take the functional connectivity data and um, uh, compare the, the entire functional connectivity matrix for individual, uh, uh, all individual pairs, but group them according to whether they are monozygotic twins as shown in the upper left uh, or dizygotic twins as shown in the second column, you can see that the functional connectivity maps are more strongly uh, correlated for monozygotic compared to dizygotic twins. And that, in fact, uh, is evidence that there is indeed strong heritability of the functional connectivity. Uh, it's not surprising, but what's nice about this analysis is that we can now probe down more closely and identify which uh, connections uh, are contributing most strongly to this heritability estimate. And one of the, the stronger connections is between the language cortex, the green patch shown in the upper panels, and the so-called default mode network that's of interest to many investigators. Again, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg of things that we've been starting to explore within the consortium, but everyone can join in uh, this kind of effort because we're already sharing the data. The Human Genome Project demonstrated the importance and value of, of widespread data sharing uh, if you go to our uh, Connectome DB database, uh, once you uh, sign the data use terms, you can get access to uh, the, the data sets by downloading it or by ordering Connectome in a box if you want uh, all of the, the data sets. We've already released uh, data from 216 subjects, uh, and it's not just the unprocessed data, but we're providing uh, uh, for every subject, uh, the minimally pre-processed data using the um, methods we've developed uh, and refined in the Connectome project. And we're also uh, providing 
uh, extensively pro process data as th that becomes available using uh, the methods we're continuing to work on. Uh, the imaging data and most of the behavioral data are open access. It's very simple to get sign those data use terms. If you want anything to do with family structure or other sensitive data, you need to agree to our restricted data use terms, but that is a very manageable thing that many people are doing. So altogether to wrap this up, uh, understanding the human brain and health and disease is a grand challenge for our century, if not millennium. The Connect Home project is contributing to this by giving us insights about brain connectivity and how it varies in healthy adults. We're already starting to see major discoveries and insights, but we should be mindful that a complete connectome across all spatial scales is well outside our grasp owing to methodological uh, uh, limitations. So we need to be optimistic, but have a critical eye towards methodological uh, limitations and challenges for each of these methods. But we do hope and expect that uh, we'll uh, learn from this the insights that are relevant to future studies of diseases development and aging. Again, I thank uh, the, the many different members who worked intensely over many years, particularly my uh, colleague Camille Ugerville at Minnesota and my talented graduate student Matt Glasser who developed many of the uh, methods and uh, pipelines that you saw here. And we of course appreciate our um, funding from the NIH blueprint. And to uh, close it out, I'll just make another analogy to the cartography uh, um, the perspective that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we've seen revolutions in earth maps from the earliest classical maps uh, and uh, likewise for the brain. Rodman gave us a wonderful classical map. Uh, we moved to a stage of book atlases of the earth and the brain. Uh, then new imaging methods gave us satellite images of the earth and functional and structural MRI views of the, the brain. Uh, Google Earth has truly transformed the way we live and navigate uh, across the earth at many scales. And we hope that the domain of connectomics will continue to expand its horizons in terms of better methods of analyzing human brain circuits and function and relation to behavior and health and disease. So thank you for your attention. Oops, and I'll leave it on that. And I will be happy to answer any questions. Um, so uh, the, um, I'll just read uh, the questions as they come. Does the study of consciousness feature anywhere of the goals of the project? I would say yes and no. Uh, the information that we have in the resting state and the the task fMRI data is a, uh, a very rich domain for exploration and uh, the dynamics of brain circuits can be explored uh, using these data sets and uh, the community, uh, I think clever investigators will be able to take these data and explore different issues, potentially even informing us about aspects of consciousness and changes in, certainly changes in mental state uh, associated with uh, the, the rich information that we have. Um, the second question is, can you track down different dopamine circuits through the brain and body? That can be done uh, using other imaging methods such as positron emission tomography. PET uh, is uh, uh, increasingly used uh, in, for studies of Parkinson's disease, for example, uh, but it's not part of the data acquisition protocol for the Connectome project. We hope, as I touched upon before, that the insights about healthy brain circuits and organization will provide a better baseline uh, with which studies of uh, dopamine circuits and other many other uh, kinds of clinically relevant questions will be informed by an improved study of how the healthy brain is organized and wired. Uh, the third question, is the Human Connectome Project able to validate the lateralization theory or the top to bottom brain theory? Uh, I can't speak to those in detail, but again, I would emphasize that by making these data available uh, to the community, uh, it's up to the um, cleverness and uh, 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 energy of the community broadly to see whether uh, this uh, um, a uniquely rich and extensive set of data can inform uh, a variety of different uh, models of brain uh, function and organization. 
Uh, the question number four is, are the areas correlated with intelligence the same as those that differ between humans and chimps? Um, the short answer is we're really still scratching the surface of that and uh, the preliminary data that I showed you was based on still a modest number of twins. So I expect we will get a much more detailed and refined assessment as we get additional uh, data uh, acquired, released, and analyzed. Um, I would um, be intrigued by that possibility, but I would not say that our evidence strongly supports or, or contradicts that hypothesis uh, at this stage. But it's, it's definitely one of the kinds of questions we would like to see addressed. The next question is a correlation or insight seen for autism or other different conditions. We hope so in the long run, because we're studying healthy adults, uh, we, um, we certainly don't have direct uh, evidence pertaining to specific diseases, but the ability to explore how brain circuits vary with behavioral phenotype, some of which are characteristics uh, that are studied in autism, may allow exploration of this. I will also mention that uh, we are uh, also at the beginning of a pilot phase of acquiring data at different uh, age ranges, uh, part of a lifespan pilot project that the NIH uh, granted uh, a supplement for. And we hope to learn more about changes in brain circuits uh, across age ranges from four to six at the youngest age up to uh, 65 to 75 at the oldest ages that will give us a window on developmental and aging related changes, but studies of specific diseases uh, will definitely require uh, other projects that we hope will be inspired by the methodological advances uh, that the Connect Home project has provided. Uh, the next question is, uh, what do you think is the greatest challenge in matching functional MRI data with higher resolution uh, 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 functional, uh, I'm having to expand this, whoops, uh, uh, with fun functional microscopy data such as optogenetic experiments in small primates. Uh, that's another very interesting challenge. Um, one of the things that is not part of the Connectome project per se, but my lab is certainly interested in is making more accurate comparisons of across species using what we call interspecies registration of the cortical surface. Um, and, and that will provide us better uh, comparisons of what are likely to be homologous regions across species. But the challenges that, that relate to looking at different spatial scales, such as what optogenetics provide, uh, there are a host of challenges. But I'm excited by the prospects of improved methods uh, invoked by the uh, BRAIN initiative that I think will be discussed in a following presentation uh, uh, this morning. And um, uh, it's a wide world for exploration. Um, next question, can you li recognize listening patterns in a patient, apparently unconscious or, or coma patients? Uh, again, this is outside the scope of the Connectome project. But uh, there is a lot of effort using functional MRI to explore brain circuits in a variety of conditions, including uh, unconscious and coma patients. So th there is an emerging literature on that. I'm not expert in it, but um, it is a well worth uh, exploration. And we'll hopefully, uh, we'll, we will see better data emerging from uh, explorations that use the improved data acquisition and analysis methods that I've illustrated here. So that is the end of the questions I see on the list, and it's also the end of the hour. Uh, so I will take this to the next stage. Thank you for your attention, and uh, uh, encourage those of you who are um, interested in CME credit to follow this next step. So thank you for your attention.